uh, it is it is a, a fun ecosystem to play in um, with all these at the Stanford Door School, at the School of Engineering, at Slack, at a national lab, all co-located, really to draw from the expertise, the resources, the people to tackle big ticket challenges and work together to, to strive towards that. So that's kind of the theme I'll be talking about today in the context of reimagining fuels and chemicals for a sustainable future. And we love chemicals. We need chemicals. You might not realize it, but we do. I want to ask a question. What chemicals are you breathing in right now? These are important chemicals. We need them for life. So let's take a look at some of those. The composition of air, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Many of you knew that with about 1% argon. And then we've got a bunch of other things. We got water vapor could be about 1% up to say 5% carbon dioxide. We all know 400, 400 parts per million in climbing. We got methane, neon, helium, krypton. These are all molecules you're breathing in and out as we speak. Oxygen is super important as we all know. That's what really provides for our metabolic pathways to do their thing and sustain our lives. These other molecules are very important as well. Uh, carbon dioxide and methane, obviously huge global warming potential. Those numbers keep climbing and it's scary. All of us can think of examples of how global warming is impacting many parts of the globe. Uh, many parts of the globe inequitably in that they didn't contribute as much to that, but they are suffering worse effects. I myself, I'm from Puerto Rico, born and raised. I've seen my share of hurricanes since I was a young child. There was nothing like Hurricane Maria 2017. You take all the hurricanes I've ever seen in my life, add them all up, multiply by 10. That still doesn't get to what Hurricane Maria did to us. And we're still recovering from that. And it's very scary to think about what the years ahead will be when we get a higher frequency of storms of that magnitude and maybe even greater magnitude. So absolutely, we need to figure out new ways to operate um, and to provide for a high quality of life. That's very, very important. So I'll be touching on a lot of the molecules that you're all breathing right now. And the one example I wanted to start with is actually nitrogen. Nitrogen, it comes in the form of dinitrogen, N2, one of the strongest chemical bonds you will find on Earth. And we breathe it in and we spit it right back out and our body can do absolutely nothing with it. But yet elemental nitrogen is one of the most important elements for our life. Your DNA has nitrogen all over it. Okay, these are nitrogen is what you find in amino acids and DNA is a chain of amino acids. So are proteins. You want a high protein diet, look for alternative sources of protein. Those proteins are also amino acids and they contain that fixed nitrogen. Where did that nitrogen come from? You might remember the natural nitrogen cycle. That 78% nitrogen we're all breathing, lightning comes in, it oxidizes it, it gets into the ground into a more fixed form where agriculture and crops can start taking that up. You, plants will grow, you can eat those plants, or you can eat the animal that eats those plants. That's how we get fixed nitrogen into our body. Let me ask you this, what happens if I snap my finger and the natural nitrogen cycle disappeared tomorrow? What impact would that have on humanity? I got good news for you. Engineers have figured it out. We have figured out how to create synthetic fertilizer, how to fix nitrogen. This is the Haber-Bosch process, been around for about 100 years. This process takes nitrogen that we're all breathing, right? You separate it from air, and you have to add hydrogen to it. That hydrogen almost entirely comes from fossil resources, from natural gas primarily, where you basically strip the hydrogen off the fossils, and you stick it onto the nitrogen from air to make ammonia, NH3, right? You open a bottle of pine salt, that's the ammonia, that's what you're, that's what, that you, we all know that smell. Take a look at the magnitude that we create that molecular product, ammonia. 180 billion kilograms a year. You divide by 8 billion people on earth, that's over 20 kilograms per person on earth of ammonia. 50 pounds is what each of us in this room accounts for in ammonia production globally. Massive staggering numbers and we needed to feed people in fact this process we could not support 8 billion people on earth without it half the fixed nitrogen in your body as you're eating these vegetables half the fixed nitrogen in your body came from this process which means half of the fixed nitrogen in your body touched this iron nanoparticle that you see right here in one of hundreds of facilities globally that produce this important chemical product and ammonia is just one of 70,000 different chemical products out there that we make deliberately to provide all the things that we need. There are many others out there. We're not going to go over all 70,000, but just to show you some other large scale chemical processes. You see on the left, this is a hydrogen producing facility. Again, natural gas is how we strip the hydrogen off the natural gas to put it into processes. 
such as ammonia production. You can see the clip. You don't buy hydrogen at the store, but the current market size is about 70 billion kilos a year over nine kilograms per person on Earth. That's 20 pounds for each of us. And actually, those of us in this room probably account for our fair share more than the 20 pounds. Gasoline at about a trillion kilos a year. Plastics at 300 billion kilos a year. Large-scale chemical processes produced to, to serve the needs of billions of people globally, taking molecules that Mother Nature provided us and doing those chemical transformations and doing it cheaply enough at a clip of about 50 cents a kilogram, a dollar a kilogram. What can you buy at a grocery store for 50 cents or a dollar a kilogram? These are extremely important molecules that provide for aviation, provide for, for, uh, for food, for agriculture, provide all kinds of different things that we need. So it's amazing. I consider it one of the greatest accomplishments of humankind, one of the greatest success stories in humankind, and yet it's highly imperfect. Yes, it, it impacts the lives of billions of people, but not all billions of people, that's for sure. And it's certainly not sustainable. And we have to reinvent the entire thing. That's trillions of dollars in the economy each year to come up with new processes that can make the things that we need, but do it in a sustainable manner. So that's what inspires us. So here's a question. What if, what if we could develop renewable pathways to convert molecules that we're breathing right now, the same ones that we were looking at earlier, and convert them into the fuels and chemicals that we need to provide for that high quality of life across the globe? Do it sustainably, do it equitably. So that's what inspires many of us. And this is kind of a vision for some of what might, that might look like. You take molecules, again, that we're all breathing right now, things like nitrogen, methane, CO2, and water. And rather than burning, say, fossils to provide the energy to drive the processes forward, can we use renewable electricity? Can we use sunlight directly? Right? And if you can be clever about that, you can do those chemical transformations where you're ripping the bonds apart from these molecules, then reattaching them to form the thing that you want to provide for, say, sustainable fuels for long distance transportation or to provide building materials. What if a building like this one was built out of CO2 that you had captured you convert it using sustainable methods to make for some type of plastic, a polymer that could actually live for 50 or 100 years, withstand weather events, withstand earthquakes. And when it's time to be done with the building and develop the next generation, you take it down and recycle that material to build the next one. We just don't have that technology. That's a tremendous opportunity for innovation. And maybe these types of processes based on, say, solar or renewable electricity can make the products that you need, the fertilizers, etc. Or maybe you can feed it into the modern chemical industry as we know it, this has already been scaled up and now you're, you're inputting sustainable feedstocks. Lots of, again, opportunity to invent what that future is. So the, the center that I get to, I uh, have the great pleasure of serving as the director of is SUNCAT, the Center for Interface Science and Catalysis. Again, we're a partnership between the National Lab, SLAC, and Stanford University. You can see some of my close colleagues. This is the senior personnel. We have theoreticians, we have experimentalists. We have people who focus on uh, synchrotron science, who focus on, on uh, nanoparticles, people who focus on computational methods of different kinds. And it's really trying to bring that team together to, to reinvent what that future may be. Now, how do we create a new paradigm all of this? One of the big challenges that we face in this particular field is that a lot of these products already, there's a low cost scalable route to cranking them out as unsustainable as they may be. And we're trying to compete head to head against that. And that's really tough to do. So this is one of the most important equations in chemical engineering. It's also one of the simplest, the production cost of any molecule that you want. It's in dollars per kilogram. It's going to be a function of the capital expenditures of what it takes to build the plant and then the operational expenditures, right? Dollars per kilo. And so here are four numbers that I'll just present to you really to kind of uh, tip of the iceberg analysis on if we want to really a new, if we want to create a new paradigm and we want to compete up here at say $1 per kilogram of product or 50 cents a kilogram, we can't afford for these things to be very expensive. We need renewable electricity to be extremely cheap. Chemical processes typically don't want to run intermittently or variably. They want to run 24-7, 365. We might need some energy storage. This, these are very ambitious numbers. If you want a, a product that contains carbon, you want to make it instead of from fossils, you want to make it from CO2 that we're breathing, then you need a capture process that's also inexpensive. And of course, you need to put it into some box that takes all these inputs and does the chemical transformations and gives you the output product that you're looking for. So it's a tall order. So I just want to share with you with the remainder of my time some vignettes on some of the things and our approaches on how we go about it. Here's one example of renewable hydrogen production. Hydrogen is kind of all the rage these days across the globe. It's extraordinary what I've seen the last two years in terms of the number of installations, projects, in terms of government financing here in the EU and many other places. 
And these, these technologies look very different than that chemical plant I showed you earlier that runs on natural gas. And so we're basically water in, electricity in, units like the one you see here will convert that. But the problem is this, this price of hydrogen is about a factor of four or five too high. And the Department of Energy released a number of earth shots, Secretary Granholm, about a year ago to go after big ticket problems. And this is one of them. This is an earth shot kind of akin to the moon shot or the Apollo program. But this is for earth shot. How do we save the earth and save ourselves? Saying we, how do we get down to $1 for one kilogram of hydrogen within one decade? dropping this price to then be competitive against the conventional markets. So the chemical plants look completely different. We need to invent what those processes look like. We need all kinds of new technologies, innovations there. One of the things that we do in my lab and in SunCat is, is we really focus at the atomic level of catalysts and say, how can we develop better catalysts for these types of processes? And that's one of my favorite things actually about chemical engineering is that we think at, at that atomic and molecular scale about what we're after here, but we also think about how do you build a factory that costs $10 billion that can crank this stuff out at, at a production rate that can actually have an impact on the globe. So we span all of those scales. So we have to think about all of those and how they feed it back and feed forward. So one of the big challenges in this technology is the use of precious metals like platinum and iridium. Very scarce, tough to scale. And so for inspiration, as one example, we look into biology. So here's, say, nitro nitrogenase and hydrogenase. These are enzymes that you find naturally occurring in nature. And they can make hydrogen almost as well as platinum can. But there's no precious metals in sight. Biology found a way. So how can we take understanding there and build up uh, systems that could work potentially at scale? And so we took some understanding from density functional theory calculations from Beard Hinneman and Jens Norsko. Jens was a faculty member here at Stanford some, for some years. He went back to the Technical University of Denmark. And their theory back in the day really pointed to some interesting effects at the nanoscale for this particular material of molybdenum disulfide. Now the details I'll skip over, but really with that inspiration, we were able to crank out all kinds of different formulations of molybdenum sulfides, trying to capture some of the motif and some of the chemistry and physics that the enzymes had, and it worked. And it opened up a whole new avenue of new types of materials without precious metals that got to a point where, say, here's McKenzie and, and Lori, who are scaling up some of our catalysts, shipping over to a company in Connecticut that builds. These are commercial-grade electrolyzers you see here. And they work within those systems as well. So we're trying to take the fundamental science and try to get it down that pathway to de-risk things so that then it could be ready to launch into commercial products and have an impact on the globe. Now, this is an example with hydrogen. Imagine if in this electrolyzer, rather than feeding just H2O, what if you fed in CO2 that we're breathing? Can we do this type of chemistry and make carbon-based products? And the answer is yes. But it's way more complex because once you throw carbon into the picture, there's a lot of different possible products that you could make. And steering that selectivity, as we call it, is not so easy. Here's some example from Kendra and Natasha and David, some of our early scholars in the space, showing that you could basically take a bottle of San Pellegrino stick in a copper catalyst, electrify it, and make the products that you see here. A really amazing list of very wonderful, big ticket, important chemicals. But unfortunately, we're making them all at the same time. And then separating them costs a lot of energy. So a lot of our effort is figuring out how to steer the selectivity so that we put the electrons into CO2 to make just the one product we want and not the ones we don't want. We've also been applying, uh, applying this trade towards ammonia. And here's an example of some of our processes. Again, electrification, you feed in N2, you pump in electrons, and if you're clever about it enough, you can actually get the selectivity towards ammonia and not towards other products that you don't want. So with that, we've actually, not that our name of the game and our goal here is to start companies, but these students I've been really impressed with on their own, despite the fact that we're at a university and, and building companies is not what we do, they found inspiration that a single one of the entrepreneurs that you see on the board here came in telling me with any sense that they wanted to become entrepreneurs, but they did. Kendra and Natasha started a company called 12. They were, they've already brought in a few hundred million in investment. They are, they're a company that's 200 strong and growing. The Nitricity crew, this is them out in Modesto. They have a farm where they're growing tomatoes and other things using their electrified process for ammonia. Uh, Dioxical, they're in Bordeaux, Sarah and Dave. They're uh, building a, other forms of CO2 electrolyzers. And here's Bill, um, who, who came up with a, an electrified way of making hydrogen peroxide, which, was a very, which is a very important molecule for chemical industry. It turns out when they launched a company in 2020, they pivoted to aerosolize it, 
because hydrogen peroxide is a pretty good disinfectant for airborne diseases. Turned out to be pretty relevant technology over the last three years. You can buy their products online, not that I'm representing them in this case. So with that, I, I want to just present some examples as to new possibilities ahead, new technologies that are needed. We're really long ways away. And one of the parting thoughts I wanted to make is how important it is to have a school like this one because it's not just about the technology. It's about the policy drivers. Rosemary gave some great examples. It's about the, the economic markets, new innovations in finance. We need sociology. We need it all. And we cannot change and reinvent the entire fuels and chemicals industry without all of these pieces working together. And that's part of why I'm so excited to be part of this school. Thank you all. Happy to take any questions.